Lift your Bibles high. This is the Word of God. The Word that saves and heals. It is the blueprint to my destiny. Today, I stand here in agreement with Deuteronomy 18 and Romans 12 because it is the truth that sanctifies because of the blood of Jesus the Christ. It is the unchangeable, the unshakable, the unstoppable word of grace. The word that redeems and releases all of my miracles. I'm not just a hearer, but I am a doer. I take action. I will apply this word and I will, I will, I will manifest in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. Turn with me in your Bibles, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 15, actually. And then Romans chapter 12, verse 2. I'll be reading the book of Deuteronomy from the New International Version and the book of Romans from the Amplified Translation. And the Bible says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, Do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, and because of these detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those. The nations you will dispossess, listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says do not be conformed to this age fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs but be transformed changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its new attitude so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you father we thank you and we bless you on this morning this afternoon god we we recognize that you're taking us into a new land we recognize god that you're giving us power and dominion and authority that you're taking us into new depths and realms that we have not experienced before we recognize god that we're crossing over into some places into this place called destiny and purpose And so, God, we pray that as we move and extend our territory and our boundaries, God, that we wouldn't be overwhelmed and inundated with the ploys and the plots of the enemy. And that, God, we wouldn't allow our minds and our bodies to be taken by that which is around and surrounding us. So, God, keep our hearts and our minds in and through Christ Jesus. Allow us to stay focused on what it is you have planned for our lives. God, we recognize that something's happening and that you're doing something fresh in our lives. And God, just in our own humanistic world, we don't want to mess it up. So help us, God. Guard us with the host of heaven. Guard us by your spirit. And God, we'll do what it is you've called us to do. And we'll be excited about it. We love you, sir. And we need you heal. And we shall be made whole. And make free. And we shall be free indeed. Blessed. And we shall be a blessing. We love and honor you, sir. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before you take your seat, tap three people and ask them, can't you see what's happening? (laughs) 
I don't know about you, but I can see something happening. I know you read a scripture in Isaiah 43, it says something new is springing up. And the question asked in the Message Bible, can't you see it? Hmm. Oftentimes, we've got enough trouble going on in our lives that we don't see the good things that God is doing. We don't see that God is, is provoking us into a new realm of life with him and into a new depth of relationship uh, that God wants to do something special, not just through us, and I know he does, but, you know, I believe that as God does things through us, he also wants to do things for us. Yeah. Amen. We know that uh, the predication of God doing something through us is that he has to do something in us, but I believe we're in a time where God wants to bless his children. Amen. Anybody ready for a blessing this morning? Amen. Uh, I thought I was at the wrong, with the wrong crowd. I thought I was with folk that were so blessed they didn't need another blessing. Amen. I can't wait to get to that place. But until then, amen, I'm thankful that God still desires to bless me. I'm thankful that God still has some plans to do good uh, by me. I'm thankful that even like David, I can sing, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. But, but, but we've got to recognize that we've, we've got to get ourselves in a posture where his blessing us can be honorable, where it makes sense for us to be blessed. Now, there's no question that um, God's goodness uh, is what causes us to repent, and there's no question that in the midst of some of our own foolishness, God does some great things in our lives. Uh, has God ever surprised you with something that you knew you shouldn't have got? <laughs> yeah. God hooked you up on something and you knew it the way that you were living and things that was going on in your life that there's no way God should have still done that thing for you. But he came in for you anyway because of how much he loves you and he didn't allow you to go without something just because the way you had done something. My God. Uh, God is good. God is good. And it, Sometimes uh, I think that the, the whole problem with us is that uh, God don't get us stoned right when we jack some stuff up. He, yeah. His mercy allows us to continue to endure. So sometimes we forget that God was being kind and patient and gracious to us uh, because, you know, oftentimes we think we got away with it. Amen. <laughs> and so, uh, but I'm thankful. I'm thankful. I'm thankful. It'll make me, it makes me shout. You know, every time I get ready to stand before God's people or go to a meeting downtown or sit in a workshop and look at the people that are around me, it kind of blows my mind that I'm sitting there with my sweatsuit on and my flip-flops and uh, my hat turned backwards because we're working. And I just, it blows my mind that God would still use me uh, even after. Amen. Amen. I know some of y'all are too religious to say amen because you're scared somebody's going to wonder what you did. I, I'm just talking about your mere existence is proof that God is merciful because in, in all of your righteousness, you done messed up enough where God doesn't have to let you uh, live another day. But not only does he allow us to live, he decided to keep using us. And that's thankful. Even on last night, I was anointed for about 15 seconds. Amen. To sing a song last night. I, uh, if you wasn't here, you missed it. I don't know when I'll be anointed to sing again. But last night, for about 15 seconds, I was right here with the praise team, holding it down for Jesus. Uh, but uh, just, just felt like uh, just watching the news late last night and just getting up early this morning and turning on the news for about an hour before I lay back down to get a quick nap before everybody began to show up. I just realized that something's happening. Things are different. Uh, something's going on in life and in the atmosphere. And not only the atmosphere or the environment of our community and our world and our nation, but in the atmosphere of the church. I just sense something God wants to do. And uh, I just wonder if I can just get a few people very quickly, don't have to take long because I just want to talk this morning, that don't mind believing God for something great and that will shout real quick with me this morning. Somebody, somebody that, that God, that you believe God wants to do something just... 
unimaginable for you that just uh, I'm looking for one of those blessings that will make other people mad yes, sir. cause they don't think you deserve it like that they, they think they know enough about you that God shouldn't bless you like that uh, slap three people and say ain't no sense in you getting mad at me ain't no sense in you getting mad at me ain't no sense you getting mad at me I just believe that God wants to do something in our lives that will bless us, uh, uh, that will help us be what God wants us to be, take us where God wants to take us. But uh, we also have to realize that in the midst of that blessing, uh, God wants to mold us uh, and wants to help us to understand our role in the kingdom and in the advancing of the kingdom. God, God wants to bring back fresh breath of air to some people I just believe we're in that season and always in October we're excited uh, about the revelation that comes but it's not just revelation it is revival uh, where God is reviving passion and potential and platform God is setting you up with a sphere of influence and not only that but he's allowing that which has been hidden on the inside of you and buried and oppressed by the stuff that you've been going through all of your mess, uh, church mess, family mess, job mess, uh, your own mind mess, uh, of stuff that you've been dealing with has, has kind of suppressed and packed down some of the potential that God has for your life. But I'm here to tell you that God has a way of taking mess and turning it into fertilizer. It's, it, it's a way that God transitions some stuff that will allow the things that you're going through to grow up and become good fruit. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't know about you, but after God has revived us from some situations, uh, he has caused us to recuperate or God has resuscitated us from times where we've lost our breath, even if it was our fault. Uh, there's a new thanksgiving that arises when God brings you back from the dead. Y'all ain't going to help me in here. We were talking on last night about my situation a couple of years ago when the doctor said, yeah, for a minute there looked like you were dying. In the moment, uh, I realized that I had gone from dying to living. There was a new appreciation for God. There was a new appreciation for the things of God, a new appreciation for life. And so I'm thankful about that. I'm thankful that God is reviving passion, not only potential, but passion, because, you know, uh, a lot of times potential can't be realized because folk don't feel like doing nothing. <sighs> Has the devil ever bothered you enough where he just made you feel like you didn't want to do nothing? Where, where he just took all of your energy. The best you could do is wake up. Now getting out to bed is another story. Where the enemy has had his hand around the neck of so many folk in the church that we live sometimes in an oxymoronic state where we are depressed Christians. Uh, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't go together. But some kind of way the enemy's able to do that. But I believe God is, is doing something fresh with us. He's doing something beautiful with us. Amen. We've got a wonderful, wonderful nursery. Just take them on back there and rock them in God. We'll bless them back there with the workers. But God is trying to acquaint us with things like unity, structure, stewardship, and character that will help us uh, transition and even uh, transpose in our lives as we move from one dimension to the other that we don't have to be the same way we've been all the time. Amen. There are some things about us that we know need to change and we've been unable to change them. We've been unable to make this catapult. We've been unable to get ourselves unwound from some of these things. Well, I'm telling you that sometimes God brings us to a place where we can just blame it on him, where we can just, we can just say God did something in my life. Because sometimes change bothers too many people around us and we're afraid that if we change, folk going to change how they look at us. Yeah. and how they feel about us. But can I help some people this morning, this afternoon, and tell you, don't give a flip about what people think about you because if you need to change and you worried about what they're going to think, if you got your change, then you really don't need a change. You need release from some chains. <laughs> you need to be released from 
bondage because people got you tied up and wrapped up in who they want you to be. I'm going to get ahead of myself. But God is trying to do something in us as it relates to character development. He's trying to bless us. And I know some of you are very spiritual and you already know where this is going. And we're going to take our time and walk through the fruits of the Spirit. And we're going to take our time and talk about character integrity in God so that we can begin to look at ourselves in the mirror so that when we walk away, we won't forget what kind of man we're supposed to be. It doesn't mean that we're already there there but we need to have a goal uh, we need to have an image that God is portraying in front of us so we'll know what we're supposed to look like so when we're not looking like it we can do something about it and so we're allowing God in this season to squeeze us and to mold us and to fashion us and to do something about our character I said it before and I'll say it again how many of you know that it's the development of our godly character that will ultimately allow you to prevail against your enemy Ah, it's not about how well you can speak in tongues or how well you can pray or how well you can prophesy or how well you can cast out demons. But see, the only way you're going to keep some enemies away is if your character is right. Ah, now, I know your anointing is going to attract some enemies, but your character will dispel it. Uh, it's going to cause us to prosper in the thing that God has both commissioned and anointed us to do. And I told you before that unlike gifts and mantles, character is measured by fruitfulness of his spirit working in us to work through us. Amen. And so mantles and gifts and anointing is given, but character is grown. And it takes time. And in order for you to operate in a particular character, you have to experience the antithesis of it. Uh, in other words, in order for you to grow in real love, you got to be hated. In order for you to deal with gentleness, you got to go through hardship. In order for you to have faith, stuff got to fall apart. Y'all ain't helping me. It's called the paradox of our faith. In order for you to go up, you must first go down. If you're going to reap, you're going to have to already sow. So God is teaching us that this fruitfulness that comes out of our character is something that's grown. And you've got to maintain. And sometimes it takes several seasons to see your fruit. Huh. Ain't nothing like shouting in October, but you can't reap till next August. <laughs> but it's your character that's going to keep you those eight or nine months that you're waiting on God to manifest his promises. It's your character that's going to allow you not to jack up on the road that God has already tread and laid out for you. It's your character and integrity that's going to allow you not to go to the left or to the right when God says this is the way and walk ye in it. It's your character that's going to bring you back to the altar when you falling and you feel like I can't get up. It's your character that's going to allow worship to allow God to breathe back in you and to repregnate you with his purpose and to remind you of what manner of man you are. It's your character that's going to allow you to be recognizable to the things of God and that God sees you at that day and says ha, ah, that's my son, ha ah, that's my daughter, my servant in whom I'm well pleased. It's your character that's going to keep God from saying depart from me you worker of iniquity I never knew you it's your character that God's going to work and mold and keep us in this place and nestled in his hand and in the cleft of the rock it's a process I say it every week because I need you to understand that it's a process. Yes. See, I'm not a prophet for prosperity. Huh. I'm not a prophet uh, for healing. I'm not, a, I'm not a prophet for your future. I'm a prophet of process. Uh. That's why I go through so much. God made me a prophet of process. God gave me a vision and he gives me revelation. So not that you can just see where you're going, but that you can see why you're going through what you're going through on your way to where you're going. Because most folk don't have a problem of knowing where God wants to take them. The problem is the journey. The problem is marching and walking it out. The problem is trying to navigate through the corridors of destiny to get to that room that God calls there. The problem is maintaining focus while all hell is breaking loose around you. The process is me keeping my eyes on the prize when everybody that promised to be by my side keep falling off and not just leaving my side but stabbing me in my back. But God won't allow me to turn around or deal with it. It's about keeping your eyes on heaven. It's about keeping your eyes on Jesus. It's about walking when you're tired of walking. It's about running when you're tired of running. It's about praying when you're tired of praying. It's about sowing when you're tired of sowing. It's about worshiping when you're tired. 
are you to maintain when you don't even feel anointed? Huh. When you can't sense love in your life, it's a character that's going to allow God to do in and through you what you need to do. But in order to get to that place, it's a process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's about being spit on and you wipe off their face. God gave me a vision of hugging somebody. And when they wrapped their arms around me, they were putting something in my back. And the vision... God told me harder. And at first I thought God was speaking to the one with the knife. And I was saying, God, why would you want them to press harder? He said, not them, you. Ah. He said, help them get it over with. Pull them closer to you. Pull them closer to you. He said, because at some point, the knife that they've been trying to put in your back is long. Because they didn't want to get close enough that you would know who it is. But when I give you revelation of who's stabbing you with the long knife, pull them closer. He said, because eventually, the knife will connect you two together. And the anointing that's in you uh, will eventually be in them. uh, And they'll leave the knife in you. uh, But don't you worry about the knife. Because I know how to take the knife out. And I know how to heal your back. But they'll never put another knife in your hand. How many of you know that you might have to get stabbed in the back. uh, By somebody that God's trying to deliver from being a backstabber. Uh, You might have to get slapped in the face. Because God's trying to deliver somebody that's used to slapping faces. You've got to be the sacrifice. But in order to be it, you've got to have character. There's something that God is trying to do in our lives. And it don't feel good. There's something that God's trying to do in our lives and it don't seem right. There's something that God, somewhere God is trying to take us and I heard somebody, it don't look right. Ah, I say it to tell your neighbor, but God's trying to do it, but God. And so I'm, 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 I'm reminded of process. Getting ahead of myself, I'm reminded that God wants us to have a willingness this is a, a easy statement but it's got something behind it to properly represent him at all times and under all types of adversity and scrutiny somebody say properly represent yeah, we're talking about somebody who wants to represent God in the way that God wants to be represented not taking for granted how we feel like doing it but representing him the right way I recognize that the next few weeks might not be real popular around here I told you I was saddened on yesterday because someone said that they couldn't hang around here anymore Because the expectation and the discipline was too great. Wow. (laughs) That's too bad. I ain't never been accused of that. Every Pentecostal apostolic preacher in town says, I've got a real soft message that I'm too gracious to the sinner. That I don't have enough element of holiness in my message. And then for someone to say that my expectation is too hard. 
because God wants the best out of us. It reminds me of the type of season that we're in. I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm going to keep saying it to the end of the year. I, I want to be in the right posture. As I progress to the end of the year. See, I don't get caught up in what folk think about me. Yeah. I, I, I'm concerned about what I know about me. <laughs> See, that, that might deliver about 15 of y'all. You could worry about what people think about you and begin to address what you know about you. Because the truth of the matter is, some of the stuff they think is so stupid, it don't matter anyway. And some of them don't even know what you know. So if all you're concerned about is what they think, you'll never address what you know. So I'm, 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 I, I want to be in the right posture to get what God has promised me. And then I want to have the right momentum as I move into 2013. I want to not only want to start the year right, but I want to start the year being right. And so sometimes we got to get that thing moving early and allow God to advance us. Now, we're not going to ever be all the way right. Yeah. Because the moment you all the way right, you walk with God. You are not. You'll become like Enoch. You will translate from here and God will shift you up out of here. So uh, if I don't know nothing about nobody in this room, I know one thing. You ain't all the way right. <laughs> so why are you looking at other folk funny? You ain't all the right right neither. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't all the way right neither. You ain't. All the way right, neither. I don't know where you wrong at, but you ain't all the way right. Now, I ain't no sense in you looking at me like I'm crazy. Yes, sir. Over the last six nights, we, we've had great preaching. People have given us some great tools and great words of encouragement. And if if you haven't planned on trying to make some of these 31 days of preaching, I really feel bad for you. You really have a low value of your own spiritual life. If you haven't planned to be a part of the corporate process of improvement of the house you say you belong to. I'm confused with people and their participation in the things of God and with the house of God. We can go to all kind of stuff. And we can plan to make all type of engagements. Like the premiere of certain movies. We like the productions of plays. We like going to major sporting events. We can't miss classics and stuff that take place out of town. We go to wedding parties. We go to bridal parties. We go to, I'm about to have baby parties. Still got some safe folks still going to fun parties. Oh my. Oh my. The ones not married is the ones I'm talking about. And we still going to the strip club. The club. Well. But we don't plan to come to church where God can do something about the thing that keeps me up at night. I'm not talking about unsaved people that don't care how they live. I'm talking about folk who whine and cry about what God ain't doing in their life. Well, I'm talking about people who blow me up consistently. 
about I need a move from God. No, you need to quit moving from God is what you need to do. I, God been trying to move on you for a long time. You keep, you keep finding yourself sliding away from the house of God and then you want to call on me. I mean, when you moving from God, calling me ain't going to help you. I ain't nothing I can say but get back to God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That girl say, call Tyrone. <laughs> Might as well call Tyrone. <laughs> if you're not going to include God. And what you're trying to do. But over the last six nights, it's been good. I mean, we've, the first night we learned that we have a potter. There is someone who loves us. The progenerator of our purpose, the one who created us and fashions and forms us. On the second night, uh, we were told that uh, redirection will fix our disconnection because we're, you know, there's some things that we're just not connected with God the right way and connected with each other according to God's purposes and plans and the provisions that he's made for us. How many of you know that sometimes people are a provision from God? Yeah. Yes, sir. There is no one who lives independently. And I, and I know so many of y'all, especially the single women, say, I'm independent. I like my independence. You're not independent. You're interdependent. There's something that you're depending on. You got a job. You got the government. You got something. You're getting cheese one way or the other. You're not in depend so we've got to be careful of our connections and disconnections but the preacher said redirection being told to come down to the potter's house can fix some stuff uh, the third night I thought it was monumental that somebody said that our promises are not buried but they're planted yeah. that was good news because sometimes you think God forgot about what he promised you Every now and then, I would, I would, I would watch the little dog Zeke, and, and he would have, he had a bone in his mouth, and I took the bone. I'm the one that gave him the bone. I took the bone because he he was a, away from what I thought was a safe area, and the more he bit on the bone, the more he scooted toward the step, and I know he's still a little retarded. He was gonna fall down <laughs> the steps because you know he's still a baby. He he, he think he grown, but he ain't. Anybody know anybody like that? You think? And and chewing on this bone was drawing him to the edge. But because even though I talk crazy, I love the dog, so I took the bone momentarily, and I placed the bone in a safe place. But he couldn't find. It. He even dipped his nose over the edge of the step. (laughs) And he looked up at everybody else and trying to figure out where his bone was. And he began to cry. He began to weep. Then he stuck his hand off the step. Like he wanted to step down, but he still had some apprehension about stepping down. And he was crying. And I just I just think about some of us sometime. And I kept saying, Zeke, Zeke, he was so concerned about the bone that he couldn't hear me. And the bone that I gave him, he allowed it to drag him to the edge. Rather than to enjoy it where I gave it to him. In other words, he tried to take the bone somewhere. And instead of him guiding the bone, the bone began to guide him. And so he he wouldn't listen to me. So finally, I had to pop him. See? And he sat up at attention. And I said, Goofy the bone right there. (laughs) And almost like I was Dr. Doolittle. (laughs) 
he turned his neck around and looked right at the bone and then jumped over and enjoyed the bone in a safe place. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't that the bone was bad. It wasn't that the bone was wrong because I gave it to him. He just had to be redirected. And so I just, I, just, I just believe that there are some people in the house that just need to be redirected. God has blessed you, and in blessing you, you let your blessing draw you to the edge. Uh, and you just need to be redirected. Uh, our promises are not buried but planted so he thought the promise was gone it wasn't gone it was just moved so that he would be safe when he had it the preacher said that we got to live in the present in his presence in other words we got to get out of our past we can't keep letting our past overwhelm us but we got to give out of our past and then uh, on the fourth night uh, the woman of God uh, said something to me that shook me it might not have shook anybody else but it shook me she said that we know how not to give up yes. and that's amazing because it seems like folk will give up on church but they won't give up on a bad relationship <laughs> we know how to give up on church but we won't give up on a dead end job we know how to give up on church but we don't you know, know how to give up on habits and stuff that we have. We know how to be resilient. It's just that we have to choose uh, where we want to practice and exercise resiliency. And, and, and we know that stuff comes against us, uh, but the woman of God said, whatever. Uh, and so it doesn't really matter what tries to draw us to stopping or to moving or to getting away from what God wants to do. Uh, whatever it is, God has given us the strength to prevail. Then the man of God told us that there was a process to making this vessel, this, this pot of clay. And he reminded us that God's hand is not only on us, but God's hand is in us. Yeah. And that God is working some stuff out and he's pressing and he's spinning. He's pressing and he's spinning. So God is working on us. On us. And then last night we were reminded about the Mephibosheth mercy that God has extended <clears throat> to all of us and that it doesn't matter how or where we have fallen. It doesn't matter where we've been crippled in our lives, but that God has given us a generational covenant uh, to sit at his table. And the beauty of the linen cloth that covers the table, it also covers what's crippled in you. And so when you're sitting at the table, everybody look the same. And so we don't have to judge each other on where we've been crippled or where we're struggling at. And I also realized that uh, this Mephibosheth had a son named Micah. And this particular son also received of the blessing. And Mephibosheth's blessing was because of an oath that David made with Mephibosheth's daddy. And so it reminded me that sometimes we make covenant with the right people that it'll bless us even after we're dead. And so it's been a great six nights. And so all these things have been explained to us and we will continue to have uh, 24 nights of word that will explain to us what happens when you go down to the potter's house. I'm almost done. We're getting, to, we're getting there. We've got not a lot to do. Uh, and God is fashioning us for a work that God desires to do through us while he's perfecting our character. The key to good character is embracing objective and absolute truth and not trying to embrace the popularity of the culture. Romans chapter 2, verse 2 in the Message Bible. These are my observations. This is just what I could see happening is what I'm talking about this morning, this afternoon. The book of Romans in the Message Bible says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity God brings the best out of you develops well formed maturity in you I told you last week that everything ain't for everybody and some things just ain't for us 
some of the culturally relative mindsets of our present culture just don't fit the character and image that God is conditioning us to walk in. Conditioning is the process of preparing the body for the oncoming season. It takes place prior to the commencement of the season, but with the entire projected season in mind. It takes into consideration not only the preparation for the need to be in shape for the expectations of its progressive strategies, but also the possibilities of the resistance and hardship that will pre be presented by the opposition. It's called conditioning. Most folk that's been involved with sports understand what I'm talking about. Before the season starts, it's conditioning. And conditioning is often a brutal time. And conditioning normally consists of at least three things. I believe that during these 52 days, God is, he has us in conditioning. Uh, the first thing that conditioning uh, has in it is stretching. It's a season where God is stretching us for the upcoming season. As we're coming into our season of coming over, this cannot be a time where we come up lame uh, by a pulled faith muscle. Uh, this can't be a time at the beginning of most seasons, uh, especially when you watch football, those who are football fanatics recognize that player after player who did not have proper conditioning keep pulling hamstrings. Because they tried to do something that seems normal to them, but because of improper conditioning, they pull something. And so God is trying to keep us from pulling our faith muscle where we become weary and begin to faint in what we know to do. We know to do right, but we become tired of doing it. Uh, we know how we're supposed to act, but we become tired of acting that way. Uh, it's also a time of testing. It's where God is allowing us to be proven in the areas of both strength and agility. It's where we have to deal with certain heat, certain pressures, and certain obstacles. And these are used as tests to sharpen us as an arrow in the quiver of God. People are being tested consistently on the field to find out what type of performance that they'll have in the time that they're needed. And as God's weaponry, we must be able to display some common elements in order for us to have a successful season. These three common elements are commitment, consistency, and worship. I call them God CCW because God wants to use us. He wants to conceal us. And at the right moment, God wants to bring us out to take care of our enemy. And with these things intact and in graduating status, the enemy is unable to shake us with his attempts of defeatable onslaughts. Uh, God puts us in position when we're committed and consistent and we're worshipers that no matter what comes our way, that it don't even matter that God will cause us to prevail in every instance of our lives and because we are graduating through these tests of strength and agility God is allowing us to deal with more than we're used to dealing with but it's because he's going to take us to places we've never been before uh, but also when I remember conditioning from baseball from Florida A&M a long long time ago another thing that was paramount was stretching in the testing that we took was rest, proper rest uh, was important during conditioning. And God is teaching us how to rest in him. Uh, not to go to sleep while we're praying, but to learn how to trust him and rely on him. That we're able to stay focused on what God is doing and where he's taking us. See, rest is vital for conditioning. Because if we get involved with too many extracurricular activities, uh, we're going to find ourselves too tired to do what God has called us to do. I believe that in this season, God is uh, telling us to begin to assess some stuff that we've allowed to infiltrate our peace. Things we've become overwhelmed with that's blowing our mind and keeping us bogged down, keeping us fatigued, and it doesn't allow the process to have its full effect. See, we've got to watch when and where we're hanging out. We got to watch how we're being influenced and what we've been influenced to participate in. Because there's just some stuff that's drawing our energy out so that when it's time to use it, it ain't there. And so God is telling us that we've got to go back to a place and we've got to get back to where we're supposed to be as it relates to conditioning. What we gave promises to God about, what we said to God that we would do, what we agreed to with God. Ah, 
the Bible is very careful about the vows we've made to God. Ah, you know how it was when you was drunk hanging on to that toilet bowl and you said, if I ever get from this position, I will never drink again. And by next weekend, you drinking and laughing about last weekend. Well, we've done the same thing in the Holy Ghost with God. If God would preserve us, if God would rescue us, if God would redeem us, if God would cover us, then we've made promises with God. And I'm telling you, we're coming up on a season where promises are due. And so we've got to be careful of the things we allow ourselves to get involved in because these things will draw us away, not from the promises of God, but from the promises we made. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 12 and the message says just because something is technically legal doesn't mean that it's spiritually appropriate. If I went around doing whatever I thought I could get by with I'd be a slave to my whims. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 23 in the Amplified said all things are legitimate, permissible and we're free to do anything we please but not all things are helpful, expedient profitable and wholesome. All things are legitimate but not all things are constructive to what? character and edifying to spiritual life so it's about the holy spirit tightening some stuff up in us uh, because we must be conditioned for the assignment that god has given us i believe that as warrior priests in the earth we must be apt to show forth godly character by our biblical representation and that god uses us to bring transformation through repair and renovation of the mindsets of a perverted culture that attempts to create a new normal I'm coming to what I see going on around me. That our culture has become perverted and is trying to present a new normal. Out of the quotations of my father, I realized that when America was dwelling in righteousness, we didn't have any problem with the basics of God's nature, his character, and his laws. We, we were known as the greatest nation on the planet. But now we've become a nation in debt. A borrower and not a lender and a lender is subject to the other nations of the world I'm sorry the borrower is subject to the other nations of the world watch yeah. this so if I allow people to do stuff for me now I got to live according to what they say is right that's why the bible says oh no man anything but to love what? one another because too many of us are being manipulated because we've been hooking up with folk who keep us in spiritual debt see so America has allowed itself as a borrower to be subject to the lenders in other words we've, we've tolerated now their gods and their ide ideologies in order for us to do business as America I'm going to help you Listen, not only do you have to tolerate their gods, but their beliefs in order to survive. So in order to stay alive, the evolution is that we have to begin to legalize stuff that God would normally condemn. Yeah. Yeah. See, in order to hang out with certain people, you got to allow yourself to do certain things that you wouldn't normally We, we have to take off our God consciousness in order to do deals and we have to do things that are unethical and questionable. This is America. So do we see what's going on? The God of the Bible is legislated out of and prohibited from government, public squares, arenas, schools, and even the court system. And at the same time, special interest groups get to push for their brand of religion to be recognized, practiced, and look, and even made to be equal to the Christianity of the Bible. Yeah. Even our media outlets now are promoting propaganda for what they call new normals. And on 9-11, primetime television introduced a new show called The New Normal. On 9-11. It's a show about a happily married gay couple 
wanting to adopt a child and needing a surrogate mother. A womb. The new normal is trying to birth stuff right in front of us. I can't find this normal at all. I found out, I saw that Paul Ryan had a word on the new normal as it relates to our current fiscal condition of this country. After he was introduced as Mitt Romney's running mate, Representative Paul Ryan made this statement, and I quote, I hear some people say that it's just the new normal. He said, but high unemployment, declining incomes, and crushing debt cannot be the new normal. It's the result of misguided policies. So then I began to think, if America then has new normals, then it must be the result of misguided principles. Because if high unemployment, declining income, and crushing debt was produced by misguided policy, then what's been produced by misguided principles? Well, probably the fact that this new normal causes America to have the highest rate of illegitimate pregnancies in the world. Maybe the new normal made America abort more babies than any other country in the world. Maybe the new normal has this nation with the number one teenage crime in the entire free world. Maybe the new normal has this nation as number one in violent crime and spending on drugs and pornography in the entire civilized world combined. Maybe the new normal causes us to spend more money on dog food than we do on foreign missions. It's the new normal that glorifies homosexuality and lesbianism through every media available. Maybe it's the new normal that's calling us to apply gays for coming out the closet and celebrating them for the ability to change the laws promoting their agenda and they only make up 3% of the population. Maybe it's the new normal Normal that cause folk who oppose same-sex marriages are considered outdated, narrow-minded, bigoted, and cynical when we're standing up for our convictions and, made, and making it known that that's ignorant to do what God said that we shouldn't do and that all of a sudden we've become unloving when we quote scripture back to what's a problem and disdain. Maybe the new normal has kicked God out of our schools and courtrooms and everywhere it came and that's why we don't see the hand of God on our nation. The new normal causes people to be offended at the name of Jesus where you can't even say I'm at sporting events anymore, public arenas, or you might get fired in your workplace. The new normal has our schools have become basins of blasphemy, atheism, perversion, agnosticism, secular humanism, and cultural relativism. Maybe it's the new normal that's called our children children to be robbed of moral standards can't even go to the library of their own school, get absolute truth off their bookshelf, read the Bible so they know how the heck to live and be given they've been denied of all access to God in the library and the result of that is that they become violent and rebellious. I'm talking about the new normal. Can't you see what's happening? But not only can you see what's happening, something has to happen. Something has to change. And the fact of the matter is, we can't keep coming to church, shouting, running, and spitting, and talking about Jesus, and then we're not going to do anything about the new normal. But I believe that there's a remnant of people that's being reworked for a great work. And I believe that it's our job, and I heard my daddy say that we have to begin to tell our children of the wonderful works of God. Psalm 78, 4 through 7 says, we will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our father. Did you see that transition? 
he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel. I'm trying to help some MIT students right there. Did you see that? See, you've been translated from your Jacob to your Israel. And Jacob got a testimony, but Israel got new laws. Y'all didn't hear me. Uh, Jacob is where I tell you where God brought me out of. Israel is where God tells me how to move on. Uh, He said, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. That the generation to come might know them. The children who would be born. That they may arise and declare them to their children. That they may set their hope in God and forget and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments God is looking for a group of people that will fashion the next generation to have their hope in God Deuteronomy 32 verse 7 the message Bible says read up on what happened before you were born dig into the past understand your roots ask your parents what it was like before you were born ask the old ones they'll tell you a thing or two I got to thinking about my own roots and the fact that when our families came over and as we came out of slavery, we were entrepreneurs and that that we were people who had integrity and character. We started businesses and in Tennessee, we were uh, landowners and farmers and we had crops and uh, we sold in the marketplace and uh, we took care of our families and uh, we made sure things were done above board. Even as we migrated to the gym city, we began to own Texaco stations and work at retail stores and manage things. But but then all of a sudden, the new normal took over. Oh, y'all didn't know I was talking about the McGuire's. I I wasn't talking about y'all, I was talking about the McGuire's. And some kind of way, it wasn't normal to own a business for black folk. It wasn't normal. To, to be landowners and sell crops in the marketplace. It wasn't normal uh, to, to, to run retail stores and to make sure things were done legitimately. It wasn't normal anymore. So the next thing you know, we were raised up a generation of hood rats. Dope dealers. Dope fiends. Hustlers. Because we had taken the taste of the new normal. But I believe in the midst of all of that that God was raising up some prophets in our family that would be used to get back to the old normal to get back to the old ancient days that even though they were lacking perfection they had a word from God so if I'm talking about the McGuire family I'm talking about the Jones family I'm talking about the Taylor family I'm talking about the Williams family I'm talking about the Macbeths and I'm talking about the Taylors and I'm talking about uh, the Coopers and I'm talking about everybody that God wants to use. There's some people being brought up out of your brethren uh, that will begin to declare the works of God. It's almost time to go, but I got something I got to do. So here it is. We've been circumcised or we have to be circumcised in our hearts that we might lead them in the right path. And not just our children, but a decaying, decaying generation of people. People who have both purpose and potential. People who have been appointed for advancement. We can't forget, don't worry about it, our apostolic mandate. We must be willing to trust God in this process and on this journey. God is developing something in us that will allow us to manifest his kingdom. Uh, I know you're going through some stuff, but this thing ain't for nothing. What you're going through is for purpose. I need somebody to understand that you're not going through hell and not going to see heaven. God's going to allow the kingdom to shine in the midst of your hell situation. You're going through it because God needs to have some survivors in his repertoire. There needs to be some people who've been through some things that God can use to show other folk that they can get through some things. And so what's supposed to be normal is that we're supposed to be giving God the glory. Uh, We're supposed to be allowing God to use us and uh, we're supposed to not be conformed to what's appealing and attractive to the flesh, but we're supposed to be allowing God to rework some places in our lives. I need you to know that God understands where you are and what you need. 
in Revelation 21 and 5, the Bible says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Even in Jeremiah 18, you see the word behold. In other words, that word in the Greek and even in the Hebrew has a similar meaning in one place where it means surprise. In other words, God is able to surprise us just when we thought could nothing else happen that could help our situation. Here it is. I'm at the end. This is the year of redemption. I know my assignment for today was to show you what was going on and where we needed to step up. This is the year of redemption where God is doing a work of restoration and wholeness. So many people that I'm looking at that is in front of me and that you know are broken and God said you're attempting to live your lives taped up. Eventually, what's getting you power won't be able to work anymore because you're doing it taped up. I don't have time to take you through how I, God said that to me and what's taped up in my life, what's taped up on my desk, but that's what he showed me. But God said he is delivering us from this masking tape masquerade. He wants to deliver us from the masking tape masquerade. Trying to fulfill other people's expectation for our lives. Rather than arising in whom he has called us to be. No longer do we try to fulfill what somebody else thinks we ought to fulfill but we've got to manifest in what God has called us to be. The other side of that coin is we got to quit running from the truth. Too many of us have not allowed God to evolve us for fear of what other people think or what they might say. We know what they know, so we don't worship the way we're supposed to. We're afraid to praise God. We're afraid to serve God because of what other folks think and what they might say. I believe today is your chance. You may feel battered, marred, defeated, bruised, ruined, crushed, broken, spoiled, at fault, trapped, victimized, and maybe even unuseful. But I believe That as we approach the wheel of the potter, it will allow him to make us over again. I'm about done. Last scripture. Jeremiah 18 verse 4 says, And the vessel that he was making from clay was spoiled in the hand. Listen. In the hand means spoiled in the custody of. Spoiled in the order of. Spoiled in the power of. Spoiled in the service of. Spoiled in the debt of. Spoiled in the communion of. Spoiled in the fellowship of. Spoiled in the ministry of. Spoiled in the process of consecration of. Spoiled in the form of. And spoiled in in the times of the potter so in other words if my custody is in the potter's hand if my order and power and service is in the potter's potter's hand if my communion and fellowship and ministry is in the potter's hand if my consecration my form and my time is in the potter's hand then I am resting assured that whatever God wants to do with me he can still do it I came by to just paint a picture of what's going on around us. But I really could have came to the punchline. Because the Bible says that that it was spoiled in the hand of the potter, so he made it over. Reworking. Ah. In the Amplified, it means to rebuild. 
It means to convert. It means to deliver. But, but what was interesting to me, for some people that might be in this room, it means that he's recalling you. That he's recovering you. That he's refreshing you. That he's renewing you. That he's restoring you. And the word means to bring a reversal. See, some of us wouldn't admit it, but we need some things reversed in our lives. If you could be honest, there's some things that you did and committed to that you wish you could just take away. But the things that are right with God that need to be reversed so that you can be right with God, the Bible says that he's reworking it. He's reversing it. And it goes on to say, and he's reworking it unto another vessel as seen good, as seen pleasant, as seemed straight as seemed right as seemed fit as seemed meet as seemed well pleasing and prosperous to the potter to make it so on a day like today you gotta see what's happening our world is trying to take on a new normal Stuff around us is getting worse. But while stuff around us is getting worse, God says, come to the potter's house so I can make you better. And not just better so you can be better, but better so you can be better useful. Employable, that you might be an envoy, an ambassador, someone who represents the kingdom of God. And I know for some of us, we, we've had some kind of lofty lifestyles and we've, you know, we've done things a certain kind of way and we don't really know what that means. But I'm talking about representing God in the earth. And when I say that, I'm talking about that there's some stuff in your life that's jacked up that in order for you to represent God, you got to have a new perspective on those things. So God allows you to see the reason why some stuff is the way it is. But more than that, God wants to do something about it. Now, I wish I could promise everybody in the room and under the sound of my voice that everything that you're going through is getting ready to end right now. And that everything is going to be peachy keen and you ain't going to have no problems and situations aren't going to come up in your life. But I'd be lying to you. And I deem not to profit lie from this pulpit. But what I will say to you is that God wants to use those things not only to fix some other things in your life, but so that you can be a part of the fixing of somebody else's life. That you would have significance in the earth. A lot of times we've just been living. We've just been here and not alive to what God wants to do in our lives. And that's why we keep going through hell. That's why we got so much hell in our mind. That's why we can't stop doing some of the stuff we know we're doing that's wrong. Because of a lack of purpose. But God wants to infuse purpose today. God doesn't want you to stay the way you've been. And God's saying it's not too late. I believe that God wants to put his hand on you today. And I know for most of us, that's just too obscure. I can't see that. I can't, I can't, can't see God's hand on me. I don't know what that seems like. I know what that feels like. And God, God told me today, just be symbolic today. Let them come and you put your hands on them. And then that'll be my hands on them for today. I'm reworking them. I'm renewing them. I'm refreshing them. And I said, God, do I go through and, and lay hand on hand? He said, no, one line. He said, I want you to take them. I want you to lay hands on them. And I want you to tell them that they're being reworked. And then I want you to spin them one time. And then send them into destiny. And so today is that type of day. I told you I wasn't going to try to preach you happy, but I had an assignment. The assignment was just to lay hands on them. The assignment was just to make sure that your life is right. And you know what I love? That's what I love with people who are maturing God to understand that the rework isn't for people that just got saved. The rework ain't for folk that left God and went to the crack house. 
But the rework is for anybody who recognizes that God needs to do something fresh in their lives so that they can fulfill destiny before they leave planet earth. Because the worst thing in life is to die and not do what God has called you to do. The worst thing in life is to try to live and be opposite of the work of God that's been already ordained for your life. The worst thing I can imagine is running up to Jesus with my praise on and begin to give him my dossier and my resume about all the things I accomplished in the earth. And he stared back at me and said, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Your character was horrible. Your integrity was horrible. Your life was jacked up. And you did it for the fashion of people and not to please me. So I believe that's what the working of the potter's wheel is all about. That we don't get into people pleasing and working for the crowds. But we begin to please God and allow him to do a work through us.